Morning and welcome to this week's Jump Discussion. This week we're talking about the second half of the sales year. You know, it's July and the question is always going to be, are you going to hit your target in 2023 or not? So today we're going to talk about that. But as normal, we're going to have some sales stats that you might not know, but you could work on for the second half of the year. So some very basic stats. Successful salespeople talk for only 54% of each sale call. However, less productive sales, uh, less productive sales people only talk for forty-two percent of the conversations. They're obviously not asking enough questions. B two B sellers, however, should uh, call prospective buyers directly, as over fifty percent of decision makers prefer contact over the phone. If your team is part of the forty-eight percent of sales people who never attempt to follow up call, you need to rethink your strategy because eighty percent of uh, sales require five follow up calls to be successful, but only 12% of salespeople will try calling after the fourth call. There are certain times of day that cold calling is more successful. Those times are between 4 and 5 p.m. in the afternoon, between 11 and 12 p.m. in the morning. Looking at email marketing, personalizing the body of your email can boost your client's response rate by 32%. There are four main reasons why prospects sign up to email campaigns. That's 34% seek special offers, 29% are looking for discount, 22% want to learn more about your company, and 15% simply want to know about your brand. But 42% of prospects are likely to took are likely to take a look at your brand website after receiving an email. So if your brand website isn't good enough, then your email is going to fail as well. About 40% of sales people rarely ask for referrals. Where 18% stay on top of their referrals, they have a higher percentage chance of hitting target. 92% of customers or consumers are willing to trust companies when referrals have come from people that they know. When customers are acquired through referrals, they have a 30% higher chance of retention and they are four times more likely to make a purchase. So obviously referrals are something that we should be really driving hard at. What about training your team though? On average, salespeople are winning. Uh, so well, I'll, I'll rephrase that. Salespeople at top organizations usually take four weeks to complete an onboarding program and fully ramped up, it takes four to five months worth of training to get them up to speed in the top sales organizations. Over 90 days, new hires will only retain 16% of the training that they've received. And ongoing training often includes role plays and things like that, which are beneficial. However, the average company only puts salespeople through role play training two or three times a year, where top performing companies do it four to five times a year, if not more. And long term training is importantly, and unfortunately very much overlooked, 85% of salespeople say they are coached to help close deals, but only 24% said they are coached on long term skills. And what about productivity? Strange fact, only 24.3% of salespeople exceeded their quota in 2021. And that may be because simply not enough are getting in front of people. Only 67% of salespeople admitted that they've made less than 250 calls to prospects in a year, while 15% of salespeople made contact with over a thousand prospects in a year. They hit target, strangely enough. Conversational selling, where salespeople chat with their prospects rather opposed to pitching, they are, appear to be more successful as top performers they only pitched their clients 7% of their time. The rest of the time was a conversational chat. And 81% of sales and marketing teams don't take time to review or correct their sales process when it's going wrong. And one in five sales reps don't have the right resources to keep their sales on track. So some real interesting things that we can start to adapt for the second half of this year and start to try hit or exceed target and work from there. This week I'm joined by the whole team, which is great. So let's get straight into it. Okay, first question then. So I'm going to make a caveat on the first question. Without stating getting closer to your clients, okay, what do you think is the key thing that you need to be doing in July in order to hit your target in 2023? 
Are we going for Definitely volunteers silence. to take this question first? Or Go for we... it, Heather. You start. <laughs> um, uh, so this made me really think, Howard, about a conversation I had with a client um, that I was coaching this week. Um, and what she's realised, and it's a, it's a kind of obvious, is that most of the people they've hired in the last couple of years have no idea what to do in the changing market. So actually, our, your caveat, get close to your clients, actually get close to your recruiters is what I would say is really important this month. They Their skill set is going to need to be different this year and as we move through this year to the skill set that they might have had. So people who've joined recruitment for the first time in the last couple of years have joined in a unique market. We're used to the cyclical nature. Most of the people on the call are used to the cyclical nature of recruitment. We understand that. But the people who joined you in the last couple of years won't understand that. So contextualising what's going on in the market for them I think it's really important for this month. And I mean, I was, I think Heather said it very well. I was about to say exactly the same thing, given your caveat of let's not talk at this moment about getting close to the clients. I think it's absolutely all about getting close to your people. And I think Heather's absolutely right about this. Um, and this isn't just the inexperienced people who have been brought into your business in the, uh, in the last, say, 12 months or so. This is absolutely about everybody in the organization. And I'm sure as we go through this webinar, we're going to talk about what's been going on year to day. And I think for most recruitment businesses, it's been a tough year. Uh, there aren't many recruitment companies that I'm aware of or that we're aware of that have had uh, the kind of year that we experienced last year. It's been a tougher year and not surprisingly. So I think getting close to your people, understanding their mindsets, their current morale, their level of optimism as we start moving towards the back end of the year, um, the challenges, the issues they're having, and back to Heather's point, uh, making sure that we're providing them with the right support and training in order to finish the year strongly and start 2024 in a in, in fine fettle. I think those are extremely important um, issues. Uh, so I agree with Heather totally on that point. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to add that um, uh, not people, but more data um, is take a look at what has got you to where you are in July. One of, one of the trends, that, that old saying, the trend is your friend. Take a look at why you are where you are. And then if I were you as a leader, I'd be looking at the next five months and saying, right, what happens if they continue with that performance? What happens if it gets better by 10%? What happens if it gets worse by 10%? And make sure you've got a plan for both. That could be more hiring, less hiring or whatever. But it's really important in a changing market that we're not swerved by the change, that we've got a plan for the market to accelerate or for for it to decelerate um, and if you're running an annual budget to the end of the year then you've got five more months of um, of that analysis to to build upon well, i think i agree with everything there and i think the big thing there is you know evaluating your performance as you said there dave and identify the gaps and areas that require improvement so that you can take specific actions to adjust in the second half of the year to increase your chance of meeting your 2023 target and I think if you don't know where your gaps are, that's your problem. And a lot of people don't sort of understand where the gap is. They just blame, oh, it's the market's hard. But it might not just be that the market's hard. Are you making enough sales call? Are you pitching enough clients? Are you talking to enough people? Have you got enough candidates in your database to actually supply the clients that you're already working with, et cetera? And I think understanding that, also understanding the cyclical nature of your clients is really important. And that sort of, you know, understanding what they do and you can look at that through historic history of your past revenues and looking at where you have peaks and troughs in the second half of the year, what's coming, what clients are like to come into that. So I think it's really important that you do evaluate your, your past performances to look at where we should be going. So if you look at that then, in your opinions then, what is the key basic strategy that you should implement to maximize 2023 and ask for one because obviously we're all going to come out hopefully with maybe the same ones maybe different ones but i'd rather sort of let's get one and then say add to them at the end if, we, if there's ones that people have missed well i mean i'm going to now go back on your first question where you said don't <laughs> mention getting close to your clients so i'm gonna i'm now going to say get closer to clients because um i think you know we are very aware that a lot of our clients have had a tougher year this year hence the reason why we've seen permanent vacancies diminish 
uh, across every sector in the UK. That isn't to say there are no vacancies. We're well aware of the fact no. there's still over a million vacancies in the country. But there's definitely it's not been as vibrant a permanent market as it had been in uh, in the last year or so prior to this year. Um, although, as we know, the interim market has definitely shown tremendous growth um, over the last eight, nine months. So um, depending on what sectors you're in, you will have had different experiences. The point here is that if they've found it difficult, if they've been slightly spooked by the economy um, and you haven't seen them recently, you do need to understand what their emotions and their drivers are as we move towards the back end of this year. And I think all of us that have been in recruitment will know only too well how quickly time passes. And, you know, we're talking about this in the, in the middle of July, nearly the end of July. It's a fact that by the time you blink, we'll be into Christmas. I know it sounds absurd to say that, but that is how it always feels. You know, we get to this midpoint and you think, where on earth did our six months go? And by the time we get to September, October, I don't know if, if anyone else agrees with me, but it just feels like Christmas is upon us almost instantly. So, I mean, it seems like a long way off 2024, but it isn't that far away. And I think getting in front of clients now to start to establish how they feel as the year, the end of the year looms on the horizon and then their views about next year is supremely important, not least because we should be talking to them about providing, to, to Howard's point, different recruitment models because of the changes that we're experiencing now, particularly around retained and exclusive opportunities. So a, a lack of knowledge about your client sentiments is extremely dangerous. And um, being close to them and understanding what they want from you by asking the right questions is absolutely where it's at. Again, back to Heather's point, let's make sure our people are encouraged, very strongly encouraged to be in front of clients and trained correctly to be able to conduct those meetings constructively. I'm going to just add one here that's slightly aligned to that, but it's slightly left of field. So my strategy would be to implement a ban for everybody in looking at mainstream media. So there are so <laughs> many negative messages, right? So the data we should be looking at is the real data, right, that Paul's talking about and how it's like, it's the real data that's coming into our business because that comes from talking to our candidates and our clients and looking at our performance data and our consultants' performance data not the absolute nonsense that we're getting fed with about you know oh doom and gloom right the, you know there's an awful lot of businesses are still doing really really well yeah, that, that's uh, true. in this market and we can yeah, be, yeah. we yeah. can get ourselves into a mindset and a mentality that oh we've got to hunker down because it's all terrible it's really not there's still huge opportunity and i think we need to immunize our business against that negative thinking is that brilliant the brilliant you are what you eat <laughs> Yes, exactly. It's a brilliant point. Yeah. It's fake news. I mean, Dave? you can make data do anything, can't you? It's absolute yeah. fake news. There is lots of very interesting stuff. There was, look at what happened this morning. You read about the new car factory being launched, I think, in Somerset, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think well, that's true. I think um, one thing I was going to say is that when you talk about your key strategies, please don't assume that every single one of your people knows where they fit in to your key strategy. So for me, one of the key strategies would be to communicate with your people so they can see in the last five months of this year what they have to do to hit the objectives, the purpose of your business, what their role is, how that fits into the purpose. And I would make sure that communication is a really vital strategy. And for me, that plays to both Paul and Heather's point, because they're being bombarded with negative messages from outside. They want positive messages from inside and they want to know where they fit. They want to know that what they do matters. They want to know that they have a purpose and that that purpose is also for the greater good of the company. And if your company has a purpose for the greater good, then let them know that. So, so I would be communicating regularly with your people. So I'm, I'm going to go a bit old school here then. So I'm going to say that, you know, as a business, you should be performing some form of SWOT analysis to identify your strengths, areas of improvement. But doing that, you should also then be conducting market research to anticipate emerging sort of talent trends so you can align your services accordingly to those trends of what's coming up. And I think recruitment, we're too busy living in today, you know, what jobs have we got on today, rather than looking what our clients are going to be producing over the next six, 12 months time. And I think we need to then start to think about establishing bigger partnerships with our clients and bigger partnerships with our candidates. And I think to gain a good network of 
exclusive candidates or as exclusive as you can get by keeping in touch with them. And I think that goes back to that performing, you know, a good SWOT analysis, what you what you need to improve on. And I think most people need to improve on their client development, but most also people need to improve on their candidate development as well and addressing that weakness because the weakness is where everyone's saying we can't find candidates because candidates aren't, aren't there. When they actually are, it's we're just not reaching out far enough for those candidates. So I think we need to sort of really position ourselves in a different way. So our basic strategy to me would be to get under your client base and under the client skin, understand what trends are going to come out of those clients and then address your candidate pool accordingly early rather than later. I'm going to make an assumption here. And you three can tell me whether I think this assumption is right, but you can. I'm going to make an assumption that every company has assessed its progress towards their 2023 target so far. So what specific actions can you take to increase the business performance in the second half of the year? I think it's reasonable to make that assumption. I think most um, organisations are all over their budgets and tracking their progress towards their annual targets. Um, for me, I think this time of the year is a good time to uh, review where we're at, obviously, and I think set stretch targets, whether you are under budget against where you want it to be, or in fact, you're tracking budget. It's a good time to actually sit down with your people and just look at what is absolutely achievable before the end of whatever your fiscal year is going to be. In this case, we're talking the end of this year. Um, if you're tracking behind budget, and that is, I think, unfortunately, in some instances, many instances, this year is probably uh, going as going on. Um, it's pretty miserable, frankly, if you're behind budget to be constantly reminded you're behind budget. I think one of the things that you want to be doing, I used to do when I was running a large business, was to sort of assess where we were and then ask people to actually um, re-forecast what they believed they were going to do by the end of the year so let's track let's have a good look at what we think we can genuinely do i'm not saying you forget the budget but let's have another look at it and then i think add a stretch to the top of that so what you're then doing is saying okay let's start talking about what's possible and see if we can get beyond that point to see if we can finish the year strongly and I would often add incentives and incentive program into that. If we get 10% above where we believe we're going to get to, or even 15, 20%, then uh, we will do X, Y, and Z um, trips, rewards, prizes, just to put some real fun and energy into what you're trying to achieve rather than the constant conversation around where we are against budget. Let's look at what's what's possible, stretch beyond that. And if necessary, if, you, if people agree, provide something really exciting to people so that you finish beyond the point at which you might have finished on had you not set that stretch target. I think, you know, I've just got, sorry. I say, I say, you know, I think that's the absolute you know, thing that I've, I've always implemented is, you know, go back to my managers if we're going to miss target and look at where they think they can get and then set, you know, that as a bronze, then as a silver, and then back to gold to where yeah. we want to be and drive them up there. And I think to do that, you've got to analyse your historic data. You've got to look at your client base. But I think the thing that I would start to invest in sort of really heavily if we're falling behind target is when I start to look at my SWOT analysis and look at where my strengths and my weaknesses are, I start to invest massively in ongoing training and upskilling of the consultants to enhance their expertise and their efficiency to make sure that we are doing the right things over and over again and start to improve that. And that goes back to the basics. You know, Everyone should be doing business development. Everyone should be doing client management. Everyone should be doing requirement management, et cetera, et cetera. And you start to analyze what's working. I think that investing in that training and upskilling your consultants refocuses their mind and it helps them to refocus on the targets that you've set and you've given them the skill set to actually achieve those targets rather than just, you know, beating them with a stick because they're behind target. I think we need to do that. We also need to look at the other hand. You've got those people who are going to be ahead of target or look at that they're going to hit target. It's how they over exceed those targets. So again, setting stretch targets to oversee exceed them is really good. But here again is an opportunity to really train and upskill your consultants in new new techniques, new technology, new efficient ways to sell. Look at the difference between the buying habits of your buyers and the selling habits of your consultants. How do you mix those together to get, get, get a better performance? And I think that to me is you know what I'd be doing now to look at the assumption that 
we know where we are against target we know what we have to do to achieve target or what we can do to get nearer to that target or overachieve that target and i think to me it, it lies in the development and the trust of your staff and to give them trust you need to train and develop them yeah and the managers right yes so and their managers absolutely you've got to inspire the leaders completely totally right um everything to play for just to pick up that last point um it's not let's be clear and heather made the point very well it's not been a terrible year I mean, everybody's had worse <laughs> times than this we've had a, it's for most people been a decent year and um uh, every reason to push on i think there's every reason to be optimistic that we'll finish this year in a stronger position economically and we know that as we get into 2024 there's going to be a real push from the government to try and bring down inflation because at some stage next year there's going to be a general election so we can reasonably assume things are going to improve albeit relatively slowly it will improve so you know it may well be and only time will tell that whatever potential dip we've had is behind us and that things are already on the up. Dave, Heather, you've got anything to add to that question? Just just three very practical things that I was working on with a couple of clients last week, which can make a difference to your numbers in the next five months. Uh, one's a cost management, what two are about sales. If you're selling permanent staff, upsell and sell higher level skills. So if you're used to selling managers, sell directors. If you're used to placing uh, shop floor people, sell those with a higher salary. And I know that may that sounds very obvious. Well, I, if you could do that, everybody could do it. But I'm amazed at the people at the desk that continue to sell what they've always sold. And yet they have the ability to sell at a higher value. So therefore, the, the, the fee is higher, the salary is higher. You can make a difference in the next five years. Basic one on contract. If your contract's for three months, ask the client for six. If it's for six weeks, ask the client for 12 sell longer term contracts at the inception and make sure your people are trained to do that and one thing that we found with one of our clients um, and made an immediate difference uh, they have a long-term relationship with a big client and over time the margin drops they were still paying commission at the old margin so when the margin went from 12 percent to 10 percent to eight percent they were still paying commission at 12 percent because the contracts have been on board for 12 months, 14 months, 20 months, whatever it was. And we were able to establish that and actually make the commission payable proportionate to what the company was getting. Those three things may sound really obvious, and I only state them because they're three things that we have put into action in the last week with two different clients. Hello? Uh, nothing to add to that bit. Oh, well, there you go. Nothing to add. So let's move on then. So here's, a, here's a, an area because this touched on what you've just been talking about there, Dave. OK, what tips can you incorporate into the recruitment process then? Because obviously things like, you know, increasing salaries, et cetera, et cetera, going for a higher salary bracket, extending contractors early, et cetera, are all things. But what things can you insert into the recruitment process to, ex to streamline its efficiency, save valuable time, but it increases your chances of finding the right candidates to drive gross profit into the business quickly. I'm going to start by. Our, our, go is that for our own people, Howard? Or is that for who we supply to? I think that's for our own people. I think that it's, I think we can do it both ways, but I think initially I'd look at our own recruitment processes so we can drive more candidates in, but also look at the client's process as well. So take it as both sides. Well, if I could oh, kick that I, off, I think. Go on, Dave, you go first. <laughs> I'm going to say, can I go first? Because I've got to leave in a minute and get on a train. Because <laughs> as you've probably noticed, I'm at a cost of coffee. This is not my normal wallpaper. Well, I was a bit worried about in the faces wake up above you, actually. I, I, know, I know, I know. <laughs> it's a cost of oh, what I was going to say is, um, actually, to help with your recruitment process, is if you're a leader and you've got a team of people, make your decisions faster. So make intelligent decisions, just make them faster. I'm amazed at the amount of time some people are taking to make hiring decisions for recruitment consultants, both at the front office and then in support services. There are not very many good people around and people are still taking days, weeks, a month even before they make a decision of whether they're the right people. If your processes and the way that you recruit are good, are intelligent, are articulate, and include enough people in your business, make fast decisions and, and, and secure the people that you want. 
because I've had conversations just in the last month with people who've gone, you know what? The first one we saw actually turned out to be the best one, but she's gone. So in order to uh, improve uh, the chance, because we all know the quicker we get people on the board, the faster they can make a difference. So m make faster decisions in hiring. I don't think Sorry, anyone can argue. No, no, it's fat. thanks, no. Dave. I, I think you've, you've said it very well. And I think, you know, you need um, at any point, but particularly at times like uh, where, where we, we're, which we're experiencing, where it's difficult to make predictions, you need to have decisive leadership. Um, and you're right. I think that, that point about make decisions, uh, I guess the phrase would be take calculated risks is important, but I'll come back to the, the point here. It's to me, it's all about uh, what they call in investors in people embedded processes. It's I think reviewing the processes in your organization to ensure they work smoothly. And if, as Howard's asked the question, driving candidates into the business quickly, I think it does come down to several obvious points. One is that you need to review your candidate care. Um, I mean, certainly client care. We talked about that earlier about getting in front of clients, but it's absolutely also about candidate care. And as I've said a million times, candidates and clients are in fact the same human beings. We just catch them at different points in their careers. So, you know, candidate care is in immensely important. These people will be buying from you at some stage, or at least some of them. And they certainly talk very loudly to their friends and on social media about the services they receive from you. So candidate care is supremely important. And I think it comes down to another point, which is to make very certain that you are using your candidate database effectively. You know, too often we see organizations um, advertising, spending money on job boards um, to attract the very same candidates that they've already attracted, who are already sitting on their candidate database. We spend money over and over again to attract the same people to our business. It's quite ridiculous. So making sure we are uh, plumbing, if that's the expression, our candidate database through well thought through strategic marketing, ensuring we're engaging people to our organization once we've met them, once they've disappeared into our CRM, supremely important. Um, in a market that is intensely candidate short, looking after candidates that we meet and keeping constantly, uh, and keeping those people constantly engaged with our business is probably, well, I would say the most important thing, but it's definitely up there in the top three. Yeah, can I just caveat I'm going to just say good, goodbye. Okay, so I'm going to ask you what you said, Dave, so you won't be here it. to argue back. Oh, no, I'm listening. No, I'm... <laughs> so we'll take that one offline. We'll take Stick, that stick the knife in. Stick the knife in. Go on, Dave. Go, go, go. Off you go, go Dave. Go. <laughs> so, no, what I was going to say about um, is just really to put, as an ex-HR director, um, just to put that different perspective in, sometimes you will really get pushback from HR directors about speeding up the decision making. Hey, and HR, you know, it is in our interest as recruiters. We want the process to be fast because we know they're going to lose candidates, right? It's in our interest and we want it on this month's billing and there's all kinds of reasons why we want it fast. HR directors don't want that. So you have to craft your argument really, really carefully when you're talking to um, the HR department, internal recruiters about that, because what they're asking is for their organisations to make really careful decisions. And it's partly because they're the ones who deal with the consequences of bad decisions, right? And so you've got to be really careful with the push for speed. I, I, I agree there needs to be more speed and they will lose candidates. But how you frame that argument and that, that discussion, it's really important to understand the HR directors, the internal recruiters perspective. They will not necessarily be being targeted on speed and it will all be about care and precision and good decision making, not fast decision making. And I getting that we... balance, you've got to have a, a, a carefully constructed argument. That's so that, that leads to the end answer then, doesn't it? That is the obvious answer is what does good look like? Yeah. And what good looks like is different for every single client, irrespective of whether you're working with them or you're going to work with them. But also what every client understands is what should shoddy looks like, because they've had shoddy practices from other other recruitment agencies so to me i think if you want to increase your effectiveness in sales and streamline the the approach you have to understand what each individual client 
what good looks like. And sometimes the brutal truth is really hard to find, but sometimes, you know, or hard to take. But I think that's the first step to getting better results with your with your clients. So if you can start to create a stronger relationship with your client, then you'll be able to start to relate, uh, develop relationships with your candidate marketplace, which is what Paul's talking about. But then it's about aligning your recruitment processes with the client's value and the candidate's will to do the job. And then it's about matching skills. So I think it's all about understanding the alignment between you and your client and the client and the candidate from a value process and a will process. Will they do the job? Can they do the job? You know, and then a skills process at the end of that. And I think if, as soon as you start to understand that, it starts to build. And if we can create consistency in our candidate interview process for each individual client, then we'll start to get a quicker decision-making process which is what Paul and Dave is talking about and what Heather's fearful because they'll understand what good looks like. Because I might yeah. say, what good, what's good for me? Paul might say, that's awful. And you might think that's great, Heather, and vice versa. And so I think we've got to understand that, that every client's different and that our recruitment process for each individual client needs to be blended to the client's value proposition and align it to their recruitment process of what they think could look like. And then we can tailor that to make it a quicker, faster, more streamlined process. And I think that again goes back to getting closer to your clients and having deeper conversations with clients. So then you can go to the candidate marketplace and actually properly develop a candidate pool that matches the clients, the candidates that the client wants. So, yeah. Moving on, are there any common pitfalls or challenges that might hinder achieving target in 2023? And how do you address or overcome them? Um, so firstly, let me just say to Heather's point um, that there's the difference between good HR practice and typical recruitment practice. HR say, let's make sure we're caring for our people correctly, I might add, whereas HR, uh, whereas recruitment, just get on with making the blooming money is really what it comes down to. To answer your question, I would say that, um, I mean, some of the most common pitfalls and challenges I'm hearing about, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of nodding heads out there right now when I say this, is to do with counter offers, candidates, um, saying they want to change jobs, getting to the point of decisions, saying yes, and then being talked out of starting the new job by their current employer. It's a big issue at the moment. Uh, employers are very anxious when somebody resigns. They know it's difficult to replace them it's because of the talent shortage. So we're seeing this particularly, well, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, I've never seen so many counter offers as I'm seeing at the moment, at least not for some years. And it's a reflection on what's going on in our market. Uh, so it's a particular issue at the moment. Um, I think a lot of coaching and training is needed around this. You can't eliminate it completely, but you can certainly mitigate the worst of the effects. And I think that comes down to how we initially challenge, interview, filter candidates from the get-go. And it's our management of those candidates right through to the uh, point of resignation that will have a big impact on the outcome. Things can be done to try to um, limit the level of counter offers presently. The other thing I would add is that I think uh, if we reverse that uh, challenge, that chat the issue out, I would say clients too are dragging their heels on seeing candidates making decisions and so forth. So you've got kind of, I think two kind of big challenges at the moment. One with clients who are slow to react, slow to make decisions, are reticent, a bit anxious. And you've got candidates on the other hand, who claim that they want to change jobs, but actually all they really do in some instances is to uh, take our offer and leverage that offer to get a better deal where they are at the moment. These are common issues I'm hearing and seeing right across all my clients. And we need to be addressing those things, supporting and coaching and training our people to try to make um, the outcomes better than they are presently. Yeah, the thing for me is that, um, it goes back to the point at the beginning, is that assumption that thing that we need the same skill set this year as we needed last year so that slight sort of complacency that we we know how to run our recruitment business and we can just carry on doing what we've always done you know recruitment has never been more dynamic <laughs> the market shifts and changes so quickly um at the moment and we have to stay on top of that so 
you know, constantly checking in with your strategic plan, constantly checking that you're on track with your 90 day plan, you know, keeping on top of the detail about have my people, even experienced people got the skills they need in today's market to achieve this month's target and just really staying on top of the, on, of the fact that this is so dynamic um, and that we, we need as leaders to be thinking strategically all the time. There isn't any room for complacency. So I think it's interesting when you look at it like that. I think the, the big thing is the intensity of the competition across the marketplace and the yeah. recruitment agencies, you know, and the, the, the distinct lack of talent. And so I think the big consistency is A, the mindset of the client and A, the B, the mindset of the consultant that's dealing with the client. You know, if you're getting rammed down your neck that it's hard to find candidates, you can't find candidates, et cetera, then you're never going to find candidates. You know, you've got mm -hmm. to start to communicate in a far more consistent way about the positives. But you've also got to, got to work with your client and look at your client's expectations because they tend not to align to what the candidate pool is actually like. And that's a difference. And we've got to be more honest with our client about what's going on and I think we've also got to be honest with our consultants because I think what a lot of consultants now they take a role they grab a role and they're, they're, they're pleased to get the role but is that role of any quality so we should be using our data and our insight to actually say we should be grading that role and only work roles that we can fill reject everything else we should be going back to our clients using data to help educate our clients and align our clients capabilities and capacity with the candidate pool's capability and capacity and that's the thing that we, we we tend not to do so i think diversifying our sourcing strategies and exploring alternative ta talent pools for candidates with unique skills is an absolute an area that could open your client's eyes to a talent pool that they've been missing out on because they've been too prescriptive with their job specification or their requirement needs from there so i think we've got to be better at communicating what's actually happening in the marketplace and then truly driving both client and consultant to be in a more positive position to actually fill the job and i think the common pitfalls are is that we don't educate our clients and our consultants hide behind poorly qualified jobs and that distinct lack of talent creates that but then the competition with our competitors in the recruitment marketplace if they find a candidate better than yours then they're going to place that so we've got to make sure that we can always find the best candidates and that's having a positive mindset to to drive outside of that and work from there so talking of growth and talking about sort of moving into 2024 in a competitive top recruitment talent yeah, it's very competitive for top recruitment talent at the moment so what typical approach could you implement to attract talent now within your business because we know what happens is people go on holiday july and august they come back and they tend to either move very quickly september october and into november and then they all shut up moving again before uh, january so if you're looking to really set 2024 up and want to bring new talent in you know Talk to me about how you can implement to attract and retain top talent for your business at this moment in time. Heather, you want to kick that one off? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll have a go. I, I, I think that this is a really, really interesting subject and something I've been engaged in discussing with many of my clients recently. And, you know, you talked top of this webinar, Howard, about all of the changes and we've all talked about the dynamic changes going on in the industry. Uh, I think it, it it should be give us pause for thought. We need to step back and look at what the market is going to need from us uh, in the coming years and ask ourselves, what kind of people do we want in order to be able to develop our businesses, remain relevant to our clients and candidates? Um, and I think that you have to step back and consider are, are, are the current recruitment processes that we are engaging appropriate for 224 and beyond are the people we're bringing into our business at the moment the kind of people that are going to be able to help us to um, maintain our positioning and improve our profitability as we as we proceed we know that ai is already having an impact on our industry um, hopefully in a positive way we know it's going to become even more of an um, of a presence in years to come not just in our business, but also in our personal lives. It's going to release our people to spend so much more time um, exercising the human touch. In other words, spending much more time in a consultative fashion with clients and candidates. 
you've got to step back from the reality now and ask when you look around at the people working for you, have they got the ability, the personality, the uh, the attitude to represent your business in the years ahead? Um, hopefully the answer is yes, but certainly in terms of looking for new people, I think there's real calls to stop and have a look at what kind of skill sets are we going to need going forward? Given, for example, that AI ultimately will start to replace roles like resources, for example. Um, what kind of people do we have? Do we want? What kind of skill sets do they need? What kind of coaching do we need to provide to our existing people to upskill them for the challenges ahead? So I'm going to challenge one comment in that, that poll because I'm going to challenge it and I'm going to keep challenging it every time. I don't think AI is going to replace the resourcer. I think AI is going to enable the resourcer to speak to, to candidates quicker, faster, in a more intelligent way. If the majority of our time of the resourcer is spent finding candidates to talk to because our searching capability is poor and our engagement with our own CRM is poor, then yes, most of our resources time is spent doing searches or emailing, et cetera. If that is automated, they can spend more time talking to the candidates that are the right candidates. So I don't think it's going to replace the resourcer. I think it's going to enable the resource to speak, speak in more engagement with our client base. Yep. And I think that to me is something that we should be looking at. And I think if we're talking about bringing new talent into our business, we should be tracking the talent that we're competing against and looking for those who are similar aligned to ourselves. Recruitment has become a big friendly place compared to what it was in the sort of 90s and early 2000s when you know, we were all out to kill each other. You know, it is really, you, know, you can find people who've got the right skill set, the right mindset, then why aren't you tracking them? Why aren't you headhunting these people? Why aren't you approaching these people? But that means that you've got to have the right business that fits their value proposition as well as your value proposition fitting, the, uh, fitting them. And technology is only just one, uh, one part of that. And from there, so I think having clear, precise uh, career paths, I think having a very, very strong value proposition and sticking by that value proposition is really important. And I think, you know, all the usual things about, you know, emphasizing the personal touch that you can provide to your consultants, because that's the personal touch you want them to provide to your candidates as well. So I think, you know, retaining and attracting Talent is all about being aligned to your values, living by your values, and then headhunting people around those value proposition and not, you know, taking all these, he's got 80% or I think they can do this, I think they can do that. You should know that they can do that when you recruit them and put them in. And I think we need to be, again, we go back to that diversity within our recruitment process. We need to be a little bit more diverse within our recruitment process to get the right people in. Can I sorry, just add something on. on the retention. Sorry, Paul, did you want to come back? I just to... wanted to kind of agree with Howard, or that's first, isn't it? That I think that <laughs> um, I think that what we're all saying, and I'm, I'm sure you're going to back this up, Heather, is that we need people that have high levels of emotional intelligence and great communication skills. Whether it whether we end up losing that resource role or it becomes a slightly different role, what we're very clear about is people that are going to survive and prosper in our industry are going to need high levels of communication skills going forward. So I think you've just said that out, and I wouldn't. So as I say, we've agreed on that point. Excellent. Over to you. So I just wanted to add a piece around retention. So part of uh, Howard's original question was about retaining top talent. So I think don't underestimate the impact of the changing market on some of your talent and people that you do want to retain. Yeah, they're um, what you I can just imagine a scenario being repeated across recruitment businesses with people who are doing pretty well. They've been with you two years. You've spent loads and loads of time. You've invested in them in training and coaching them and they, they're making money and they feel good about it. And then the market becomes more difficult. They maybe don't have the level of re resilience that a five year, 10 year recruiter would have because they haven't seen a different market. And somebody is then able to come and headhunt them from you because the resilience isn't there. They don't understand that this is a cyclical market, that it's dynamic um, and that it's it's not that they need to move somewhere else. They just need to tweak the way they work. They need to adapt to what they're doing. And so you could end up with people that you've invested loads of time in going to your competitors just because they're not they don't they don't understand the dynamic nature of the market and that the fact that they need to work slightly differently. Yeah. Um, and so they end up moving and you lose people that you really don't want to lose 
for the want of investing some more coaching, some more training in people that you thought were finished. But the reality is that the market's changed and now they need some more development and more training and more coaching and more support. So final question then. We need to make it quick. We've answered quite a lot of this question already, I think. How can you align your team's effort and resources to ensure a strong finish in 2023 and set the stage for a successful 2024? I think it's a rallying call. I think it comes yeah, from it leadership. I think it's about making sure people feel upbeat, um, excited, uh, well supported, valued. It's about making sure that everybody understands what what you're trying to achieve, creating excitement, not only for the in terms of finishing strongly, but reinforcing where the business is going and what's in it for the people who work in that organisation. And I don't just mean from a financial perspective, I actually mean from a career perspective. And I, I think it is that I think it's about just creating the positive vibe in the organisation, which always comes from leadership. I'm going to say yeah, something I similar. Agree that, more. It, yeah. I was going to say something similar that, you yeah, communication has to increase but it needs to upbeat and factual even if results aren't happening it needs to upbeat and be factual because i think we're all in the same boat and everyone needs to be encouraged to row equally as hard as each other but also encouraged to row in the same direction as each other and that means about setting clear achievable goals and i think sometimes what we've got to understand is that owners and managers of business will set their own goals but do the actual people within the business agree and think they're achievable because if they don't think they're achievable they're never going to go reach out and go go get them so i think there's no point in setting that goal so we've got to set agreeable targets and then stretch them but that's all about collaboration and supporting environment that fosters the cohesion and it's all about knowledge share and i think what paul said there it's about it stems from the leadership and what you're pushing down into your business and i think there's a great opportunity now over the next six months to really energize a business to finish 2023 on a high note and start 2024 not on the front foot but actually running forward and i think there's a, a great opportunity because if we look at what the stats are saying and next week we've got neil carberry on and he will tell us more about what the market's saying it looks like the market has bottomed and it's now starting to come back again so if that's the case we need to be running not stepping when we hit 2024 heather i uh, couldn't agree more yeah rallying call rally the troops don't make any assumptions the market's different treat it differently indeed so ladies and gents thank you very much for your time today dave i hope he's on, he's on his train i hope he actually made his train paul heather thank you much for your input as always as i said next thank week you. we've got neil carberry on you know it's gonna be really interesting listening to what neil has to say from last time he was on sort of i think it was march time that it was on how much the market has moved and changed and what's coming up with the marketplace so join us next week for a really interesting conversation with neil carberry Thank you very much, everybody. See you next Thank week. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.